Okay. Okay. Well, we want to welcome everyone to the second part of our two part workshop called Foundations of a pa Parish Pastoral Council. Um, this workshop is designed for members of parish pastoral councils and for pastors and administrators who have parish councils or who want to initiate parish count pastoral councils or revitalize them. Um, it's part of the annual PACE conference, that, but it's held virtually this year due to the fact that we're still in the COVID pandemic. Uh, we wanna welcome everyone back. As I said before, um, I'm glad you're back. Uh, we're gonna try to get the recording available for those of you who couldn't be here last week. Um, part of what Sharon is going to share, as we said last week, and I wanna to to remind everyone that these are some best tools um, and practices for parish pastoral planning, but you always have to um, consider the, the priest, the pastor. Um, councils are advisory, and we have to keep in mind that our church is a hierarchical church, and it's the pastor who actually leads the parish. So, you know, as we worked, we have to work together collaboratively with the pastor. Um, you know, so what Sharon's going to teach us today is some tools for parish planning and some team exercises. And before you can move forward with business of planning, it is important that the councils function as a cohesive uh, leadership team. So this is called Tools for Collaborative Engagement of a Council in the Planning Process. Uh, Sharon Bogus is with us. She's currently the Director of Campus Ministry at Frostburg State University in Maryland and a young adult minister in Western Maryland. And she's had a wide variety of experience from different dioceses uh, such as Pittsburgh, Baltimore, and Greensburg. So without that further ado, I'm gonna ask Sharon to take it away. Thank you, Bernadette. And thank you everybody for coming back or for those that are here for the first time, uh, thank you for joining us. As Bernadette said, um, I have, have a lot of different experiences in, in ministry and from the wide range of working with little children to working with uh, senior parish members in a community, both on a diocesan level and a parish level. So it's my great pleasure to be here with you today. Um, right now, I, I'm having a lot of fun playing and sharing faith with um, college students. So um, what I thought we would do for this session is uh, focus a little bit on some of the tools that we need for pastoral counsel and also what makes that healthy and functioning. And, and to a great extent, we don't always talk about the relationships or we sometimes talk about the relationships of council members to one another when we're in the parking lot after the meeting. I know that's probably not your parish, but I've been in parishes where like, you know, those kind of conversations sometimes happen. And so today we're going to uh, take a look at, um, we're gonna explore the five functions of a cohesive leadership body, which is based upon uh, Patrick Lencioni's work. Um, there are two works, um, the five dysfunctions of a team some of you may be uh, familiar with that from your marketplace workplaces. Um, and then the other work that he developed after that, which is based on the same, same sense of those five functions and dysfunctions is um, the advantage, which is another uh, tool that he has. And he has helped to translate that into parish life in a number of different ways. And one of those is through his uh, work with the amazing parish, which has really helped with parish revitalization um, and parishes that are reorganizing in many dioceses as we're, as we're seeing across the country. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna explore the five functions of a cohesive leadership body. And we're going to base that a little bit on today's, um, last week's session, um, the prayer session part of that. Then we're going to discuss the pastoral planning process. And I'm using a tool that was developed by the Diocese of Pittsburgh. And uh, it is translatable to from one diocese to another. 
Uh, and there may be some things that are unique to your diocese that are different in Pittsburgh and vice versa. And, and some, so we may need some adaptation as you consider it, but the general vision of one body, one mission, uh, really gives us a, a good sense of what the planning process needs to look like. And then finally, we're going to review the process of uh, selecting council members, uh, how they may be nominated and discerned, um, and how you know present council members can continue to, to discern whether or not they're continuing to be feel called to being on the council. And of course, that involves some self-assessment and uh, prayerful uh, group assessment. And um, obviously uh, the invitation and the assent of the pastor for that, for the advisory councils. So let us begin with prayer. Um, what I thought I would do is I selected the prayer for the synod that's going on at this time. I thought it was appropriate for us as we do have a jumping off point. So let us just pause for a moment and remember that where two or three are gathered in Christ's name, he has promised to be in our midst. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We come before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every place and time in the communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever. Amen. In the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So last week we began um, part of our reflection and prayer with a foundational look at uh, St. Paul and Ephesians and that idea of preserving the unity of the spirit and the bonds of unity within a parish community. And we went from that to outlining a little bit of what is really at the heart of parish life and what is at the heart of Christian life and what our destiny really is. What is the work of a pastoral council? What is the work of the church, but to make disciples and be on mission? And so we are rooted in one God, one community, and one mission in Christ. And we have those bonds of unity. And as we start to look at what it means to be a leadership body that functions well, we have to uh, consider the things that can sometimes, you know, tear that apart. What can make our difficulties or cause us to have difficulties within a planning process, within any group that we are a part of, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in our domestic church or the home, or if it's in a leadership body like the pastoral council or pastoral staff or wherever that might be, what breaks the bonds of our ability to work together as one on the same mission and purpose? And I guess I wanna kind of ask you that question from your own experience of parish life and the church, um, family life and work, what are some of the things that in a group, in a group of leaders, in a group that it comes together and has been assembled by someone called forth from a community like a pastoral council, what are some of the things that, you know, cause disintegration within uh, or a break that bond of unity within that group that is called to work together. 
what is in your experience of that, particularly in the parish? What makes our groups dysfunctional? What are some things that happen in our parish communities that make a group that we're in dysfunctional? What are some of the behaviors? They're not behaviors that you exhibit at all, but uh, <laughs> but anyone, one or two people want to say, um, give me an example of something that really can tear a group apart or cause dysfunction within a team? Well, political partisanship can. Certainly, certainly. <laughs> and that's, that's both, you know, in our democratic process, but also within our parish community of people who might say they're conservative versus liberal Catholics. Um, so it, it goes across many. Um, that's a very good example. Thank you. Other things? People um, so wedded to their own idea that they can't hear any other on. Yes, they, that we um, have come with our own agenda or our own thought of what is right and not in, in having a closeness to being able to hear others beyond, because we can't, we can't get beyond what our own thoughts are. Anything else? Any other ideas? Busters, liars. What was that? Oh, that was probably some, another conversation. Lack of consistent attendance, um, not following through on projects, on committee projects or council. Account accountability um, and, and presence. And, uh, you know, there is, where we can't, don't hold each other accountable and we don't hold ourselves to the, the presence of being there. So sometimes that's because there are vague, vague expectations we're talking about volunteers in our parish community. And so people like myself who are sometimes on the staff, you're like, well, they're volunteers. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, scare them away. So yeah, okay, don't come if you can't come. And yet we need consistency. There is consistency of presence that is important that we need to um, be able to hold each other to that accountability. Those are some really good examples. and. Um, what I'm going to do is put my screen back up here. And so those are some good examples of what can break the bond of unity. Sometimes within the community also, there could be um, side conversations. Uh, there can be, you know, and I use the, re the reference of the conversations in a parking lot or an inability to speak freely uh, and not trust one another. So those are, those are things that can break down a group that can help us disintegrate and not really allow us to then be truly about the mission, about the unified body of Christ, the unity of this group that has been called forth from the community to be the eyes, the ears, the discerning hearts of where the gospel of Jesus Christ and his mission for the world and our parish community come together. When we have those, those bonds of unity that are broken, and we can call that sin, we can call those growing edges, whatever it might be. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's immaturity, uh, whatever it might be that can really cause damage and prevent us from being able to be about the work that we are called to do. So Patrick Lencioni um, kind of wrote a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and it was a kind of parable. And it's, it's a great story. And the way in which he puts it together is that he says that the five dysfunctions of any team, whether it is a paid staff, uh, a leadership body like a pastoral council or a finance council, any, any with the dysfunctions of that team that break down the unity of the bonds of unity within the group and its inability to have results, at the, at the very fundamental level of that is I think certainly an absence of love because we're not loving each other well enough so we don't have trust. And we don't have, we have an inability to be vulnerable and be able to really put ourselves out there and share what is a concern of ourselves. We have a fear of conflict. Um, and we have like, and what that can look like is a false sense of harmony. Um, when we, you know, 
sit silently and, you know, agree by, you know, just agree to something that we don't really believe in. We need to be able to have unfiltered dialogue. Um, that leads to an ambiguity or a lack of commitment. Maybe that means people stop showing up or they stop following through because they're not sure that they have the authority to do something or that they that half the group doesn't want you to do it because we didn't really, they really didn't want it. To, and we couldn't, we didn't trust each other and we didn't decide on what to do next. And that can lead to low standards and, um, and an inattention to results meaning that we can meet and meet and meet and we don't get anything done. And so when Patrick Lenciani talks about the things that can really tear a group apart, he says, these are the signals of that. The, uh, an absence of trust, a fear of conflict, a lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability and an inattention to results. Sometimes we look at say, well, we didn't do anything, but we don't always even know why something didn't happen. And so his, his recommendation for a group, for a functioning team is to kind of flip this around a little bit. And um, really what he says builds on what Pope Francis talks about as far as the church. And that is that we need to have a deep reverence, a deep love for one another's experiences, a respect and a trust of one another, an ability to listen to one another and to recognize that everyone has something that they bring to the table, bring to the group, bring to the kingdom of God. And so Pope Francis says that the church has to initiate everyone priest, religious, and laity to the art of accompaniment, which is really walking side by side with the community, with each other, and to remove our sandals and, be, and recognize that the ground that we are at, the ground that we share is sacred and holy. And that when we encounter the person across from us at the council table, uh, at the dinner table, at the, con at the work table, we are, in it's holy ground. We are encountering Christ. And in that is at the heart of that is, you know, God is love and, and not a, a cushy kind of like, oh, like romanticized love, but one that is self-giving, self-emptying and putting our own agendas aside and putting ourselves at the service of one another. That means that no one agenda is pushed forward, but that we are able to hear one another because when we gather at the table as a pastoral council, as a leadership body, we are, we are gathering at sacred ground. We are walking side by side like Jesus did on the road to Emmaus with each other, with the community. And there is a lot of respect that comes at that point. That's the theological undergirding of that. And the way in which you might talk about that from a uh, ecclesial perspective, a holy perspective. Patrick Lencioni takes it from the perspective of uh, the marketplace and uses slightly different language, but really what it does is it builds the, the language that he uses, the functions that he calls us to are really the things that can lead us to true unity, true mission and true um, commitment to one another. And he calls these um, five behaviors a framework for a cohesive leadership team. And we go back to what were the dysfunctions. And he says that these five functions form uh, the framework of a cohesive team. These are the elements of the things that we want to find, that we want to build, that we want to assemble to be a strong leadership body within the parish community. And in, or in, in order to do that, we need to work on ourselves and have certain amount of self-awareness of what we bring at both our strengths and also our growing edges, those areas where we might have uh, uh, areas where we have failings, you know, whatever, whatever that might be. 
that we need to be able to set that aside and acknowledge it and build um, a cohesive team. And so the most important layer of this and he, in his pyramid that you see here, um, the, the bottom layer before all else, if you don't have it, you're not gonna get any of the other elements in line for a team is trust. It seems, you know, easy to kind of like, oh yeah, I trust you. You're not going, you know, you're to a certain extent. But even below trust, it's built on love. So the gospel is love. And from that, we come to an ability to trust one another. And that means that we're, we need to be able in a group to be genuinely vulnerable, to share our story, what's going on in our life, what our opinions, and also be able to you know, truly listen and be honest with one another. That means that we, you know, we're going to sometimes, we need to be able to get to know each other in that group. And that sometimes coming together and just starting to plan something may not work, but we need to do the work of team building within that pastoral council in order to be able to accomplish what we in the future want to be able to accomplish. So we need to have trust in one another. That means we are transparent and we're honest and we, you know, we then, you know, speak with unfiltered dialogue. We speak in charity, but we say what we think. We can challenge one another. We can engage in healthy conflict around ideas, not conflict that is, you know, backbiting, but conflict around ideas. Well, I have this idea and uh, I can be very strongly and strong in presenting it to the point that sometimes we can shut people out, other people down in the group, or they have certain needs to be able to process something. So we need to have a certain amount of self-awareness so that um, if we even need a little bit of time to say, you know what, I am not ready to be able to say, I think that's the best idea. I need a little bit of time to process this. Then we need to be able to have trust among a team member to be able each the team member to be able to give each other that space because we're all different and all of our talents and all of our experiences are a very important part of the results that we're aiming for um, that build up the kingdom of God in our parish community. So to build trust, we need to be able to be genuinely transparent. Um, and to be able to express what our needs are in that group and also be able to hear what the needs of other people are too. Sometimes people are extroverted, some people are introverted and knowing that means that um, one can't dominate the conversation and then, then move on without making sure that everyone around the table has a chance to, chance to speak. And so it, it, there's a lot of dynamics in that, in that um, framework of a meeting working well. We've all been in meetings where, you know, we just like probably want to just throw in the towel and like not come back. But, but the truth of the matter is that when we are able to listen to one another, when we are able to uh, be vulnerable, build that trust and be honest about our opinions or uh, you know, I'm not quite sure that I'm, I understand what you're saying. Can you rephrase that? Uh, it means that we're engaged in a dialogue and that allows us that trust of being able to speak up and know that what I have to say is going to be heard um, with respect and vice versa. Um, that can really make a big difference when it comes to a pastoral council or any team is that trust level. And it allows us then to engage in conflict around the ideas. We're able to have unfiltered dialogue, which means we say what we're, we think um, respectfully and in charity, in love, but we can debate ideas. We can, you know, sometimes things can get a little bit, maybe a little bit heated, but we can exchange those ideas. Um, and, and, he's, and Patrick says that, you know, having that trust allows that dialogue. And it means that we're able to really hash something out and be able to commit to the decision, make a commitment and be, and if we all 
are able to make a commitment because we've been heard and respected and our thoughts have been considered in the process, it's easier for us to make a decision and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to follow through on that. I was heard. I may not have gotten exactly what I thought we should have done, but I was convinced that, okay, there might be a better way of doing this. And that allows us to be able to hold each other then uh, to a certain level of accountability. That means that, hey, you know, something didn't get done. Uh, Jane, is everything <clears throat> okay? You said you were going to do something. So we need to be able to have a firm commitment, um, a clear plan of action. Have you ever walked away from a meeting not knowing what was decided? And you come back and say, everyone else has a different idea because we never really said, well, this is what we've decided. And we look at the minutes and we say, well, no, it was decided. We just kind of talk around in circles. So we have trust. We engage in conflict and conflict isn't bad. In fact, we need to dig for it, which sounds like crazy, doesn't it? We want to dig for conflict because if everyone's sitting at the table in the silence and the silently agreeing with Jane, we want to make sure like, okay, I'm presuming that none of you agree with me because you're being silent. I need you to say, yes, I, I do agree with that. Silence is not necessarily, uh, sometimes that's violence. Uh, silence is not necessarily agreement. Usually it's not. It means that we don't wanna have conflict. We're afraid of conflict. And so that brings us to the decision process. And then we're able to hold each other accountable because we all committed to something and we can, we can work on the plan of action. We know what the steps are going to be and we have a plan of making sure that it happens. And that ultimately brings us to being able to achieve the results that this council has set forward. And in most cases, that's going to be the pastoral planning process. How do we you know, help you know, take the vision, listen to the parish community, walk with the parish community, be, you know, hear what their needs are, what they say their needs are, and what the gospel tells us as well. And what the church is calling us to, because sometimes it's not enough to say, oh, the parish community says that this is what they want. That's quite a um, consumer version of church. Yeah, there are certain things that we might want as far as our spiritual needs, but ultimately we want to be able to listen and measure those things against the gospel and what the church is calling us to. And sometimes that makes us move in small steps and, and sometimes it has us moving in bigger steps. So we, want, we need trust. We need transparency and honesty. And it, and it can begin best sometimes with the pastor too, being able to help us in that, in that area that it's okay to be vulnerable. Uh, maybe it's the facilitator of the pastoral council that's a, you know, make sure that everyone around the table is heard. It may, it also takes courage on our part that if we don't feel that we're being heard, that we kind of bring that, bring that forward and that we say that. Usually that, not usually, but that often is the um, place where things are broken down in uh, the dynamics of a functioning team and a cohesive team. And that is that I don't speak up and I just, okay, I just don't wanna rock the boat. So I'm not going to argue with you or that I'm afraid I'm gonna be shut down if I say something that is in opposition to someone else's idea. So we need to be able to hold each other accountable if, if a shutdown happens. So that kind of makes sense, but we need to step in into those kind of things. Yeah, Sharon, I just wanted to add that some of the councils that I've worked with, some of the good thing to start with that trust is to like have a retreat or have some kind of experience where you get to know one another on an intimate level through prayer, reflection, faith sharing, rather than just in a meeting setting. So, I mean, can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, and I'm really glad you brought that up because where we are able to get to know one another, it becomes a little bit easier for us to be able to really hear each other and, and know where the other person is coming from. And so that can happen through um, retreats. 
Some of that can also happen with how we be, how we get ourselves onto the how we become members of the pastoral council through the discernment process of that and selection process. That it is just that there is a selection process. That there is a way in which we are we are taken through together of of sharing those talents and gifts. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that might look like um, further along. But all of those things. Um, help us to not just come in and be about business, but be about relationships. Relationships trump everything else. Um, if I feel that I, you know, have a best friend on the council, if I feel like, you know, you're all my best friends now, then I can feel that I can speak to you honestly, that, um, that you care about me, you care about what I have to say. And so that can happen um, most often in those social times and gatherings that are maybe outside of um, the council meetings, beginning each meeting with a prayer, uh, an extensive prayer where we maybe do a little bit of faith sharing. Uh, that, and that can help inform our planning and assessment process while it also can be, and be a foundation for that, while it also helps us to continue to grow together as um, the people of God in this one, this one body and in unity with one another. So definitely at least annually, it should be a retreat of some sort. Um, as part of every, every um, council meeting, there should be not just some whip, you know, whip through it prayer, but maybe something that's a little bit more extensive that can help set the stage for our, our meeting. Uh, maybe it's just looking at the Sunday scripture with each other a little bit on that and doing a little bit of faith sharing. And you know what, in truth, as Catholics, sometimes we have to learn how to do that. Um, we're not, we don't always feel comfortable, you know, sharing our faith and what we hear God calling us to. Um, we can make it very personal. But the truth of the matter is that we are communal. We're communal. We're a community. And it's important for us to hear those things from one another. Any comments about these five functions? Uh, now, the truth of the matter is that while these are the, the, the elements of um, a cohesive team, we have to really put things in, in place that help us to build that trust. There can sometimes be um, tools that we've used in the marketplace like strength finders, um, the Clifton strength finders. Um, it might be the um, Myers-Briggs, those different things that we can, sometimes there are some assessment tools that are out there that help, can help us uh, obtain a language that we can have in common about being able to um, know each other a little bit better. And so, so sometimes those kind of assessment tools can help um, as part of a retreat process or a team building process. But all of those do, what they do is they give us a common language to work with. Uh, and also help us to grow in self-awareness. Uh, sometimes it points out something we already know about ourselves. And sometimes those tools um, give us a new insight that maybe we weren't even able to see ourselves um, because we can have blind spots to the ourself because we live in our own body. We live, it's all natural. It's like how we, we just function. We don't know that it's, a, it's there's anything special about it. A, we don't know that it's a special talent. Can't everybody do that? So, um, so we come, sometimes can be blinded by our own ex personal experience. So the, uh, there needs to be work that constantly is being done in team building. And this also, um, not to um, spend too much time on it, but also can be translated into the um, other groups within the parish community too. You know, so the, you know, finding ways that we can um, have a common language with one another, a common trust um, is, is going to be very important to having, um, to uh, getting anything done, to really building the kingdom. We don't have to do it perfectly. There are going to be times when, you know, uh, I've had teams, I've been on teams where we worked on this a great deal, and then we got a little bit away from it because it's easy to do that. And all of a sudden we have a problem. We're not listening to each other. And so those are the occasions where we need to have the courage to call, our, call us all back. And it doesn't fall on just the pastor. There's an accountability of everybody on that team that says, hey, you know what? We're really getting off track here. 
And so it takes courage to be able to say those things too. Um, and I don't know if I'm painting, uh, if this is, um, if you're getting a sense of what this is, but this is the team dynamic elements. And these are the key, the key principles of that. Any thoughts or comments, anybody else? Have I totally confused you? It's reassuring to hear uh, the idea of the importance of knowing each other and interacting with each other. Because I think that's something that our, our council is working on now. But I realized that after being on it for a time with the previous council, I really didn't know any of the people. We came in, we had a meeting and we went home. And you know, this time we're, we're really working at doing things so that we get to know each other and can build those, those relationships and have those trust relationships between one another. Thank you. Um, I'm glad that you um, that you were able to see that too. It's um, one of the things that made me what what I thought of as you were talking um, is the need for us to be affirming of one another too. That when we get to know each other, we need to be able to affirm each other too. The giftedness, the unique quality that this particular person brings to the council. We don't want a council full of the same people. We want diversity. We want diversity of certainly economics, of race, of, of, of talent. You know, we don't need everybody that can be as great with a spreadsheet. Um, we need people that are good with spreadsheets, but we also need someone that may have other talents as well. And we need to be able to be mutually affirming of that. While at the same time, one of the things about self-awareness of being able to have a trusting body is to know also the things that I'm not really all that great at. You know, the things that, you know, I find painful. I hate, I can do math. I can, you know, figure things out if I have to. But if you want me to be the one running the numbers for the, the upcoming festival um, or whatever it is that the parish is doing, uh, I'm, not your, I'm not your girl. I can do it, but it will painfully kill me slowly. And so if there is something that, yeah, I'm able to do it, but I don't really, I'm not talented at it, then there isn't a lot of enthusiasm around it. And it's likely that I'm not going to be able to follow through on it as well as I would like. There's gonna be stress, there's going to be tension. I may not even, it may just not even happen because I avoid it because I don't wanna to have to do it. So knowing each other and knowing the talents around the table, affirming one another. Um, and the things that I do well, they come easy to me. So it's, it doesn't take me anything at all to like walk into a room and put do this, 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 and this to set something up. I might be able, I can walk into, I can walk into a classroom and do a presentation on almost any topic for an hour and a half and even have creative activities on it, believe it or not. I'm an educator. And so that's what I can, I can bring. Someone else might bring something else to the table. And, you know, and I, I'm energized by that. So knowing ourselves and what brings us energy and saying, hey, Father, you know what? This is something I do that I love to do. Can I do it for the parish community? Can I do it as part of this committee? I love taking minutes. Can I take the minutes? Someone else is gonna be sitting there saying, oh, thank God, I hate taking minutes. Or someone else that might be a gifted facilitator. They may be able to say, hey, you know, you're really good at that. And we can point, we can recognize that in, our, in other people as well in the group. And the more we affirm, the more trust is gonna be built too. And then as we're affirming, it's also a, we're able to say that, you know, Hey, Sharon, I noticed that you seem to really struggle with doing like the math of having to do that, that it's, you seem to be really quick on doing these other things, but you're kind of slow on that. Um, do you want us to give that job to someone else? Do you, you know, and, and, and you do it in a gentle kind of way, but I noticed that you look like you're struggling and not just let me hang out there to dry. Um, and it, it takes awareness. It's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. 
And so sometimes we do it really well, and sometimes we really stink at it. <laughs> but but the the awareness that these are elements that make for a good team um, in a functioning body um, is half the battle because we know that we want to have trust. We want to get along with the people on the council. And that can be part of the discernment process too of, hey, what gifts do you bring? What is your vision for the parish? Those kind of things. Okay. And I'm looking at this as sort of like a, a general type of boot camp where you have a, a uh, catalyst, uh, a drill sergeant who brings his fellows in from all parts of the country, all different uh, ethnic groups and religions. And uh, he takes them, breaks them all the way down, and then begins to show them that they have to trust each other and work together to form a unit so that they can achieve whatever the end is that they have to achieve. And, uh, you know, I think that's what you're aiming at with this particular uh, show. To, to some extent, um, not quite the breaking down completely, but the heightening of like the awareness that I, I think there, there's a, um, in, in a military setting, there's, there's a real value in that breaking down part to build back up because you're like, this is life and death situations you're gonna find yourself in. Um, in, a, in the church setting, the same kind of idea is that um, not so much break, breaking down in the sense of being self-aware, of knowing the elements about myself and the other people on the team that can make us function well. So, and that takes the time of building the relationship. So it's the getting to know Sharon and what makes her tick in a good way, not like what's gonna push her buttons so that I, I'm not driving her nuts, but how can I, you know, how can I build her up? Um, because remember the first rule of Christian life is love. And so at the heart of all of our groups is that. So it's a different kind of breakdown, but it's like figuring out the, the elements of that. So thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm going back to this pyramid thing. So you kind of get a sense of that. And um, I have sent this PowerPoint to um, Bernadette. So I think she'll probably send it out to all of you too somehow, um, or if you can request it from her office. Um, so when we're talking about this leadership body, we know that the pastor, every pastor needs a pastoral council who is collectively committed to helping him grow the parish. So not only are we looking at the, um, personal growth of the individuals on the team, the individuals that are part of the council, because that is growing the parish is also about our ongoing conversion of becoming the best version of ourselves and the person that God dreams us to be individually. I mean, that's the whole idea about conversion and becoming, you know, holy. But in doing that, that means that the pastor needs the council committed to helping the whole church do that as well, to grow in holiness, to help us to become what God dreams us to be. That means also self-aware. When we're self-aware, we learn our growing edges. We learn the ways in which we need to, you know, become better people as a community, become more mission oriented. What are the areas that, you know, we, we need to work on? We have, our pastors need um, all of us to be able to set aside our personal preferences and agendas and focus on what is the mission of Christ. That means when we are becoming, when we focus on the mission of Christ, we need to know what it is. So what does the church, the wisdom of the church say about this? What does maybe the church, do the church documents say about something? Right now we're in the midst of this, starting this, this synod, the synality of, of, our, of our church listening to one another. And, and that's really in some ways, a lot of what the, council, pastoral council does on a regular basis with a pastor is we listen to the signs of the times and we know the gospel and we work on bringing those together and we pull in the experts that we need. We make sure in the, the tools that we need and the knowledge that we need to be able to do that. And we entrust ourselves to the Holy Spirit. So we're constantly prayerfully 
setting ourselves before God, the Holy Spirit, to guide us. The cohesiveness of communion in Christ is the measure above all else. So our, our goal in mission and as a pastoral council, as a parish community, is communion in Christ, is oneness in his, his saving and redeeming activity for the world and how that manifests itself in the parish community in the different areas of parish life. So we can, there can, there's a structure in how we can look at that. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the planning process for that. But essentially, our goal is cohesiveness. Our goal is communion. Our goal is oneness, the, the unity among the diversity. Um, and, in, and a cohesive leadership team means that we are in the bonds of communion with Christ. Not only as a team, but as a, so our communion, the communion that we share um, every Sunday, um, that is the body and blood of Christ, is, all, is not only in the food that we eat, but it is at the, at the table of the Lord and the drink that we have at the table of the Lord and the, what we um, hear at the table of God's word. But taking that and having it transform us so that we are and constantly becoming again the holy, one holy Catholic and apostolic church at St. Joan of Arc Parish, at, you know, St. Peter and Paul Parish, wherever it is that we are. And so we're, our goal is always going to be communion, is unity. And that means that I have to set aside my preferences. And let me just tell you, I don't like to do that. All right. I'll be doing lots of confessions in here. So I'm not telling you anything I don't struggle with myself, but we're all in this together. So that moves us on to the pastoral planning process. Before I, I jump into that, um, any other, anything about what I've said so far about the functions of the team? Uh, he wrote a whole book, he wrote a whole book on it. I mean, there are all kinds of workshops that can happen with it, but you, I hope you got the like the little kernels of what um, we need to be working on. Bernadette, is there anything that you, any question you have where you're good? Okay. All right, let's go back here. The pastoral planning process. The pastoral planning process looks at the whole needs of the, the human community within the boundaries of your parish. And that is every soul within those boundaries. Everyone, whether they are Catholic or not, um, our parish community is responsible for their spiritual well being. That seems um, huge, and it is. And, you know, we do that one step at a time. But that is really the whole idea around pastoral planning. It's not just about the local community, but it's about our going out into it. And no matter what model of planning a parish pastoral council chooses, um, it's important to remember that we have to do it on an annual basis, meaning that we are, if we have, a, if we develop a pastoral plan, we're constantly assessing it and continually looking at how it might need to continue to be refined um, and to make sure that the that growth is happening within our parish community, that the parish life is, is thriving and that we are making progress. Um, and, you know, again, are ready to experience, you know, when God throws us a curveball like a pandemic and what does that happen, what happens then or whatever it might be the curveball for our, our community. Um, being able to recognize that a pastoral plan for a parish community is a uh, living document. Um, the mission statement might be a little bit more, you know, firm, but the pastoral plan is a living document. And the process um, involves all of us. It involves every member of the community. And it looks at and um, the five qualities or characteristics of parish life. Now, um, these are the ones that the Diocese of Pittsburgh has outlined and various um, dioceses across the country might look at these particular areas in different ways, uh, evangelization, some parish, some dioceses are going to say that's the overarching. For the Diocese of Pittsburgh, they sat at, at Eucharist at the center. 
evangelization in one of the corners, catechesis in formation, stewardship, um, liturgy might be another one for, you know, sacramental life um, uh, would be Eucharist in this case. So whatever your diocese has outlined um, or your parish looks at as far as a uh, area of parish life, these are the broad um, categories that are pretty consistent in the the dynamics of uh, of the life of a community. We're we're always going to be sharing the good news, um, doing catechesis, and and helping people come in relationship with Jesus Christ. We are always going to be evangelizing both the inwardly and ex externally. You know, those that have already um, uh, believe the gospel, but we're going to continue that ongoing growth in holiness and formation and those that are hearing the gospel for the first time. Stewardship, the, the acts of charity that we do, the, the way in which we um, provide for the means for our mission, whatever that might be, um, financially um, or time talent, um, time, talent and treasure. So whatever those areas of parish life, they're primarily the ones that we're going to be looking at when we are doing an assessment of what's going on and what our needs of the parish are. Maybe, uh, you know, it's, we recognize that there, we might be a little bit weak in youth ministry and we wanna be able to build that up in some way. And these are the things that we need to do for that. Our confirmation program needs, so, our efforts need some work. Uh, whatever it might be, do, what, um, whatever it might be, we look at those, um, those areas of parish life, recognizing that the liturgy and the Eucharist are the source and summit of our community. Um, and, but that all these areas have a main focus as well, where we are, we want to figure out um, what the, the life of the parish community needs. And they are not statically, you know, you pull it out and here's evangelization. Uh, they are interwoven. They interact. And the more we learn our, our theology of, the, of parish life, the more we uh, consult the experts in the particular area, which might be this parish staff, um, the director of religious education or the music minister and liturgy, the liturgy person, or uh, if, not, <clears throat> if not a person, maybe it's a, it's, it's a tool that the, the church provides. Maybe it's the constitution on the sacred liturgy or something that, you know, presents for us uh, the vision and hope for our community. We want to consult that expert and then begin to look at how we translate this into the specific needs of this, lo this local parish community. So, but they're all interwoven. So it's hard to pull them out and separate them, but to recognize that they kind of go together also. I have so, a question. Um, I see evangelization, catechesis, stewardship. I know what those are. Formation gets thrown around a lot, and I have never heard anyone tell me exactly what formation means. <laughs> well, think of, um, I, and, and you know, and that's really a good point because it's people who say things, use words that are, may carry a little bit of weight in different, in different ways, but if formation is, the shaping of the person, um, their, their intellect, their spirit, their uh, all elements of, the, of who the person is becoming. Catechesis tends to be a little bit more education, you know, um, and, and the reality is those two words are often used um, in concert with one another. And along with evangelization. So it's uh, yeah. the formation is shaping, is a shaping of us in the ways of holiness. And those other tools how are end up being tools to help us in that too. So but formation is shaping us in to the person that we are called to become. So it's the the holistic part of who we are. 
health, one health. Mm -hmm. There's intellectual formation. Um, and, and actually there's, there's spiritual formation. There is human formation. There is intellectual formation. There's pastoral formation in the church. And each of those um, have a different kind of element that uh, a focus. Um, and sometimes, and again, it's hard to separate it all out because it is, it is connected with each other. So um, like human formation is looking at some of the stuff that I, I was talked about today. And it's, it's, it's the area that we maybe do the least amount of work in the, in with the laity. Um, but we do a lot of it with um, priests in formation in their formation process. But that is like looking at the you know the stuff of our lives, the the elements of that make us who we are. Um, that are often those self awareness things that I was talking about, knowing what my talents are, knowing what my growing edges are. Those. Um, knowing how to have boundary with, with other people. Those are kind of like form, human, form, human formation. Spiritual formation is going to be more around the, um, the prayer life. Um, intellectual is maybe theological. You know, so, and pastoral, it would be how we do the, um, the work of the church, how we, we, ec how we execute that. Um, so I know, I don't know if that helped at all, but it may have confused you more, but, but now you have four more words to go with it. Is that helpful, Margaret? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't confusing, but it does, it does help. I mean, the way I see it is any aspect, any of the other aspects or the um, parts of, they all have a formation part to them. Just, you know, how do you, when, when, when children are in catechism classes, they're being formed in, in a, you know, a beginning kind of way. If you are going to go out and do mission, you're being formed and growing in how you're going to do that. So it seems like that's a big underlying platform instead of like a separate corner, like Pittsburgh put it, I don't know. Yeah, and as soon as you, they make a, a graphic, the, as soon as you make a graphic, it's, you know, not perfect, <laughs> but you're, you're right. There, um, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. And that's where we go. And how does the church define that? And, and it's many different documents. So there's like, um, anyway, there are a lot of different ways in which we can look at that, but you're right. Those are, catechesis might be a tool for that. You know, there are different things, but it's how, what shapes us. Okay. So there can be a lot of confusion unless we as leaders guide the discussion and articulate the key areas and values of the parish. What are our values? And, and the church does that for us in many ways, but we need to engage each other in that conversation as well. Um, it helps to say that these are our values and this is the direction that we need to go. Um, and the pastoral council facilitates that uh, but it needs to be a sy systematic approach. We need to have um, a dialogue about it. And then, or otherwise, it's going to be random activity. If we don't undertake this, then it's kind of, we just kind of blow with the wind, like, oh, let's try this. And we don't necessarily uh, cover all the areas of our, of our parish life that need attention. And we may have big gaps within the community, within the community, or we may have stag stagnation, where we are really just trying to maintain, and it's the bare minimum, and not in moving us forward on our journey of becoming again um, the church that God dreams us to be. So the planning process is very important for that, and. Uh, the way in which the Diocese of Pittsburgh has, again, put it in a graphic. And this, this 
is not all that unusual. Uh, we pray and we reflect there. So there are certain movements within the process. We wanna craft a mission. So we pray and reflect on what, what is our mission statement for our parish community. And there, to some extent, every parish community could almost have like the same mission. You know, it is to bring us in relationship with Jesus Christ, to bring his work of salvation to the world, to, you know, uh, to give praise and glory to God. But how might that be crafted in a unique way for this local community? So we pray and we reflect. We gather and we analyze data. So there's a, there's a systematic approach to this. There, we assess parish life. And, um, and again, I mentioned this last week and um, Bernadette may end up, I might help her develop this or um, you, the Diocese of Pittsburgh, I know have a lot of these in their closet because when I left, they had them, but um, they're one, it's called One Body, One Mission and it takes them through a process. There's also uh, another resource that um, I meant to bring with me today and I didn't, but that the author of the Diocese of Pittsburgh did for uh, Paulist Press, I believe, that has many of the same elements. And it'll take you through the process of what are the kind of questions that we need to ask our community? How do we go about doing that? Do we do surveys? Do we have town hall meetings? Do we you know, do we call people up and do an appreciative inquiry where we ask, you know, a cross section of parishioners, you know, the same questions to kind of gather and assess the, the spiritual life of the parish community, the, the intellectual life of the parish community, the catechetical life of the parish, all of that. Um, and if I could just jump in really quick, the synod, you know, that were that Sharon mentioned in the beginning is a perfect platform because the diocese has already rolled out our initiative and I'm not sure if you all are aware, but each parish has been, um, has selected a coordinator and they're going to be going to training sessions that we're holding throughout the diocese and then they're asked to conduct listening sessions where we, they have the community and they have these questions before the community that they're going to be asking and then we're preparing a diocesan report. So, and, and I know also the diocese just conducted that survey, the diocesan pastoral council sent out a survey and they're in the process of collecting that data. So, I mean, that fits perfectly what the church has already called us to do to use that data to, to maybe initiate some sort of process that Sharon's talking about. Absolutely. And, and that is probably the most cutting edge in the, in the, in a, in a, as a model. Uh, it's especially uh, modeling much of the accompaniment language that Pope Francis has in the Joy of the Gospel and his other, his other documents as well. But that whole idea of how we go about um, obtaining that information. And, and so it, it becomes one of the models that you, and right now the key model of the church uh, for be, to being able to do that. So it, that, that can most definitely help shape how that assessment process would go in analyzing because the whole church is doing that right now. So gathering and analyzing data, um, developing goals. So once we, we listen, once we look uh, at what the church is calling us to right now, um, and we blend those two things together, then we help to, we develop some goals um, and objectives, goals um, and strategies for, the future of our parish life that need to be measurable, that need to, you know, have um, have a plan around them. Uh, so maybe using SMART goals, if you're familiar with those. Um, and, and then we need to also communicate that in this constant communication with the parish community, that they know what's going on, that they are engaged. And, and how you do that is going to be different in different models. And again, the Senate is a good example of how the, the process might be utilized. But you may find that 
that doesn't quite fit your parish community. And you might have to, you know, take the same stuff and collect the information in a different way because you there's a unique character to your community. Uh, not that you say, well, we always did it this way or it, you know, that didn't work before. We might need to refine an uh, element of it and, and try it again. Um, so we pray, reflect, we gather and analyze data, we develop goals and objectives, and we consult, we pull in experts. So the consultation of experts, sometimes like, you know, that people, someone that has experience in that particular area, and we want to make sure that we communicate the, the goals and objectives. Uh, we want to communicate those to all the groups in our parish community. We want to hear from all of them as well, and how you know, how is how are the goals of our community now going to be embodied in all of our all of the work of our church? Um, how would you go about implementing that? And then on a regular basis, evaluating that and monitoring it. And that's really the work of pastoral council. It's not always uh, it's not like, oh, the pastoral council runs the spaghetti dinner. You can, you know, those things have to happen sometimes, and you may have a particular talent and love of doing something like that. But who in our parish community is best equipped to do that? And that means just as we want to find out what the talent is on our council, we need to also find out who it is that are in our pews. And again, I think I mentioned last week, and I it bears mentioning again that the Gallup organization. You know, they ask that question. They, they ask people, you know, are you able to do what you do best in your parish community? What do you do best? Can you share that in your parish community? And most people say no. So we need to kind of figure out how to help people do, do what they do best and to thrive in our parish community by being who God created them to be. Um, and then we continue the cycle um, in the process again. Uh, it's an ongoing process of um, looking at that. It's cyclic. We're constantly looking at evaluating, assessing, um, and, and empowering others to implement. Sometimes uh, a certain, certain goals and objectives may most likely fall under um, a particular area of parish life that might have a staff person that oversees it like catechesis. And so the council doesn't go to the director of religious education or formation and say, hey, you have to do this. The pastor communicates that. But we also want to make sure that in the assessment of where we need to go, that those staff people are also, they're experts in particular areas that they are also part of the process, that they're not left out. Because sometimes um, where this planning process can get broken is when we say that it's not something the staff does at all, it's just what the council does. And the reality is we, it's a, the staff is also a pillar of parish leadership. The council might be facilitating the process, but the, council, the, the staff has some real um, important input there because they're working on the day-to-day -day operations in those particular areas of parish life. And also not, you know, but they have a perspective. It might be a very good perspective, but it's not the only perspective. And so they need to be able to listen to, uh, to, you know, what the council is saying. So it's important for all the leaders, the bodies of leadership to be in, engaged in that, but it's a cyclic process and it, and it just, it continues. So let me uh, let me add before we go to this one. Let me stop the share for a second and and ask. Okay, any thoughts or comments on the? I, I'm giving you broad sweeping strokes. This could be easily a, a five six sessions training. Um, does, any questions about you know the general gist of what? The expectation is there. You're good. Hopefully, that some of this is affirming things that you already know, um, and and then maybe even like saying we need to be doing this all along. Um, 
Okay, so finally, there is the discernment um, of members. And um, I didn't have, I, I'm best at probably giving um, Bernadette a, a, a copy of an example of how we might go about doing that. So I will email that to her and she, you can request it from her office. But a discernment process is really looking at taking individuals through uh, the consideration of where God might be calling them. And this can be done in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that I usually recommend is that it's not, um, an election. Uh, you, there can be some nominating kind of process in, in that you can put a list of what characteristics you might be looking at for a council member in the bulletin or in announcements and say, hey, you know, do you know someone that meets the, this, someone that has this, these gifts and talents? Is there someone that you might want to recommend for discernment that they may enter into the process of discernment? And um, so you want to make sure you have your, you know, clear outline of what it is that you're going to be doing. And so you ask them, you know, the service name, send them to the facilitator of the pastoral council, send it to, you know, the inbox of the secretary of the parish that will pass them on to the pastor or whatever they do. But you're going to want to ha have a small subcommittee that's going to help of the present council to help move that along. Then you look at all those names that you get. Um, and maybe you get a lot, maybe you don't get a lot. But once you get 20, maybe, um, you, you ideally you want like 12, possibly members of the council. Some people take a little bit more. Some people have a few less, like seven, and that's, that's okay too. Um, you have to discern what you want in, as far as the number. You don't want 30 people on your council, but you may have 30 people that, come, that are, put forward as cons for consideration. Well, what are your expectations as a parish community of what the council does? Where do you go? You maybe go to some of the notes that I, I've given you the last couple of weeks. Um, maybe you, you know, buy the, get like the resource, uh, maybe you look at the Senate process, but you, you need to decide what are the characteristics that you're looking for. And certainly one of the things you wanna know are what the, what's motivating somebody to maybe accept um, the call. But we wanna really make it, set it in a foundation, a prayerful consideration. So, so dear so-and-so, dear Sharon, your name was suggested for the parish pastoral for consideration, uh, for invitation to the discernment process for pastoral counsel. These are the qualities that we are looking for. And we'd like to invite you to a prayerful evening of discernment to, as you consider what, you know, the, the, the role of counsel um, to consider that. We, we are, so the thing is when the names are submitted, the pastor can go through them. He might naturally eliminate a couple of them himself just because he may know parts of stories of people's lives that they're just not available to do it or whatever. Usually we want to put that in the hands of the person themselves to decide. But we invite them to, the first step in the process is we invite them to an evening of reflection. And if they accept the invitation, then they've made it through the first step of the discernment process. If they don't make it to the discernment, if they can't make it to that, so they maybe okay, you're not available at this time, that's okay. We're going to, you, we'll ask you another time, but so the, so we want to go from 30 to 25, that will come. They're, they're just, you, we set up steps of self-elimination in some ways. And so you, you move into the next step and it might be, you know, taking some time to ask them to reflect on a particular scripture about the many gifts um, you know, in the same spirit that we hear in the gospel, not in, well, certainly in some of the gospel, but in the letters of St. Paul. We then start the discernment processes with them. We ask each person to introduce themselves, talk about how long they've been in the parish community, um, 
How have you, you know, what are some ways that you've been involved? What ministries or activities do you do? And then there's like a, a systematic, you know, process of introducing themselves to the whole group, everyone that's discerning, present council members and, and potential council members. And there might be some kind of acknowledgement of that, you know, after they introduce themselves, there might be a little, not necessarily a blessing, but an acknowledgement. And then you move on to the next person. And, and it's it seems somewhat to people at times to be a laborious process. They look at it, the people I've done the process with, I, I pastors have asked me to come in, like facilitate a process of discernment in their parish community. And it, you know, it sounds like oh, that's a lot of just listening, but it's all important listening, especially when we're looking at we eventually being able to build trust and know each other and be able to recognize the gifts of each other. We need to be able to hear the stories of one another. Um, so you go through like an initial set and then you may then, you know, what gifts, what gifts for ministry of leadership do you bring? You may ask them to say something like that. Um, and and are you moved, do you feel that you're moved to offer those to the pastoral council? And that might be just that, that one night of going through like the 30 people that, or 25 people that presented themselves and you wanna hear from all of them. Um, and then you may ask them, you know, now that we've had this time, do you feel that you are being called to the council? This might be the first, like, I'm gonna step back and say, yeah, no, thanks for inviting me, but I, I don't, I, th I think I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna move on. Would you like to move to the next step of discernment? And, and that might be, you know, after we articulate with the, the vision and mission of the parishes, you know, what part of them, you might show them the mission statement. What part of the mission statement is most challenging to you? Um, what do you think would be the biggest difference uh, that our parish life needs? You know, what, um, I'm looking at some questions that I have here in front of me. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I, I'm blind here. Um, what are the greatest stumbling blocks moving our parish forward? You know, and, and again, these are just some questions, but the sin, the sin in may have questions that can be built into a, a discernment process. But remembering that it's always a prayerful process. It's rooted in scripture. It's rooted in listening to one another and um, listening to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then, you know, you know, I, as you listen to the gifts of everyone else around you, you may say that, wow, I'm really, I'm, you know, here are what the expectations are of the committee. So the pastor says, well, like the commitment that part that Teresa mentioned, you know, do the, do you, can you show up for all the meetings? We need you to come to all the meetings. Well, you know what, they're on Monday nights and every Monday night I'm flying out of town for business. So I really can't, I would love to, but I can't make the commitment at this time. That is a self-elimination. Um, now in the age of COVID, we do a lot of pastoral council meetings right now on Zoom. So that can, might be something a little bit different. Um, and we have discovered that. So, it, you know, is Zoom a tool that, you know, and this is something the pastor has to decide in advance. You know, what are, what are the expectations? Um, certainly, you know, attendance and, you know, we really can't, you can't miss too many, you know, more than one meeting a year or something, or we have one meeting, one, how many meetings are there a year? How many, just a quarter or whatever it might be. So those need to be defined. And then, you know, again, we offer them opportunity to step forward or step back. And, and I have to tell you, whenever I've taken someone through a process of, the scripture and the questions. Um, it's, we've never ended up with the 25. We always ended up with like the 12, the seven to 12 that said, yes, I feel like I'm called to this. I know that I, because people take it very seriously. They are, you know, there's humility in the process. There is, um, they like know themselves and what their needs are. They get, they can recognize the gifts of the people around them. And 
you know, and then, okay, they, at the end of the, that session, they approach the pastor and say, yes, I'd like to still be considered for the council. And at that point, the pastor can take it to the next step. Uh, and I have a whole outline process of, of how you can do this in steps that Marianne Gubish from the Diocese of Pittsburgh um, developed. And you can piece it together in different ways. Um, I'm also available to take a team through that as well. Sometimes it's good to bring a facilitator or someone else from outside in to help do that process with you too. Um, I just wanted to say we only have about eight minutes left. <laughs> So. Any thoughts about that? I, I'm just about, you know, um, concluding that. And, you know, then there's like a commissioning that can go with that as well. Um, we want to make sure that there, we ritualize it. Maybe there's a certificate that goes with it. Uh, and part of the formation might be like this saying, well, you know, the diocese has a training process and we need you to, you know, participate in that. If, so that's going to be part of your commitment that um, and I know that like the Diocese of Pittsburgh for a while, I'm not sure what they're doing now, had that where pastoral counselors, pastoral counselors and finance counselors went to like, I think it was five sessions. I don't remember exactly. I, I used to be the director of the office there, but I don't remember what we did. <laughs> um, but it was like, you know, multiple sessions to learn about what the council does. Um, so there might be a training process. You might, we have an annual retreat with the staff, we have, you know, whatever it might be, um, making sure that people know what's at, what the expectations are and that they're going to be held accountable to it is going to help make that discernment too. And it's, and usually it's going to be self-elimination um, or self, you know, presentation. And it might also be that at the very end of all that, when you have the leftover, the left, the discerned people, leftovers <laughs> this is certain people um okay you're going to meet with the pastor he must have an individual meeting with each person um just to kind of ha have a conversation it depends on the pastor has to determine what that is as well so it, it's it's uh but it's deeply spiritual and and really that's all i had to say about that i i it's there's so much information um I, I think I um, want to open it up to any comments or questions again. One thing that I didn't hear mentioned, and I think it's very important that part of the expectations include attending parish functions and of course the Holy Mass. Um, it, it's, it seems like a no brainer that they should, but sometimes you never see parish council members any place outside of the meeting yeah that thank you for bringing that up yes it, it, the presumption and that it needs to be outlined in this process as well is that they are a catholic in good standing that they regularly participate in the sacraments um that they are not um there's no and nothing that's going to impede them from you know doing the the work of the church for some reason um and that uh, a willingness to be able to be at um, events. And that's, so part of that, you know, you need to flesh that out and outline it. But you're right, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, it is a, in some ways it goes without saying, but it needs to be said. And what if someone comes on and uh, they agree to all of these suggestions, but then they don't end up doing it how do you tactfully or kindly say perhaps this isn't the right um this might this is not the right ministry for you. Uh -huh. and that's julia i mean there's 20 so okay 26 participants right now at the peak there was 34 okay but of those nine are mercer county a third of the people attending are Mercer County because father pushed it. Yeah, and I, that's just that's it. That's where the father I, comes in, or a person, maybe it's a staff pastoral associate that he designates to do it. Uh, I was just recently in a parish where I was a pastoral associate that was designated to do those kind of things to accompany um, the pastoral council and. Um, 
and and that's where you know that's where he he has to say he has to pull someone aside and say hey is everything okay first and foremost is pastoral care what's going on and 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 so what's going on with, with this person that they're not able to come not to presume that they're just being you know remiss and saying this isn't important but um our our first rule of Christian life is charity, uh, is love, and so. But that would be something that the the pastor might call, you know, call them up. It might be that you have a strong parish facilitator on on the council that regularly communicates with the staff and might or not staff, but the the council and and just calls someone up and say, hey, how are things? What's going on? We, have, we haven't seen you for a while. Is there something that we can do to help you? You know, I think that is the approach to it, and then. If someone needs to be, um, uh, if someone needs to be terminated, that belongs to the pastor. It's why he gets paid the big bucks, right, <laughs> Father Sebastian? <laughs> okay, thank you. That's a good way to handle it. Well, I think our time has almost come to an end. I did want to thank Sharon. Um, I think we should give her a round of applause. And we thank her for and it, getting the conversation started because we knew that this was something the diocese needed. Uh, when I go around to talk to different parishes and people, they're always like, can the diocese provide some sort of help for our, par our parish council? And hopefully this is not the end of Sharon and I's relationship. And then maybe we can build some materials to pass on to the parishes. And I thank you all for coming and and joining us. Uh, uh, as far as getting the PowerPoint, Bernadette, do we just email you or? Yeah, Julia knows how to find me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, anybody wants to email me, it's bkime at dwc.org. Um, I'm the director of worship. I'm not hard, that hard to find. And um, I'll, um, I'll get the uh, discernment pages um draft out to you too and you again it's not a hard and fast like science you can you need to be able to shape it for yourself and like we've been saying it with everything with the synod and you know like you were talking about 25 30 people uh, name some of these parishes have 20 30 people attending you know in their community so you know again in west virginia it's not a one size fits all you know and we're aware of that so you know like sharon said these are best practices take it and use it and adapt it to your own your own needs with like we said with the blessing of the pastor so thank you any final words before we close God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you.